we turn unto thee, our Heavenly Father, for thou art our help and comforter, thou art our <coughs> refuge and strength in the midst of the storm and the strife of life. We thank thee that we may ever and again resort unto thee and uh, find a, a new peace with thee through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray then that thou wouldst be speaking thy word of, of comfort to us this day, strengthening us by thy Holy Spirit, by that same Spirit uh, instructing us out of thy word. We thank thee again that we may turn to the message of the prophets of old and uh, find how from of ancient times uh, thou didst uh, make known for the uh, hope and, and comfort of thy people uh, the prospect of the coming of that uh, Savior who should vanquish the evil one and open the gates of heaven for thy people. We thank thee, O Lord, that we live in the fullness of time and we can see how these ancient prophecies have come to pass in the coming of our Savior in the accomplishing of his great <coughs> mission of redemption on our behalf so that we find that we who in times past were no people at all and, and strangers to thy promises and the commonwealth of Israel <coughs> have now been brought nigh that thou hast broken down the <coughs> middle wall of partition and uh, drawn us uh, who were far off unto thyself unto an intimate fellowship with thee through Christ in thy spirit. And may we, by our study of thy word, be built up, each of us, in his own uh, soul this day. And may we also be equipped to, to be ministering unto thy people everywhere. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. What we're doing then right at this point <coughs> is to <coughs> illustrate by uh, examples of uh, 8th century prophets so uh, uh, many of the things then that we have analyzed uh, previously about the functioning of the prophet and about the whole nature of, of the covenants. Uh, I it, had in mind, and I think uh, announced that I would deal with Hosea as an example of a northern kingdom 8th century prophet and then turn to uh, Isaiah, at least certain parts of it, as an example of an 8th century prophet in the south. Um, I, I think what I will do, that, however, is do the Hosea example, and then for a change of pace, uh, hold off on the, uh, the treatment of Isaiah and, and his conduct of the lawsuit again, and uh, hold the treatment of Isaiah off until the later in the term, and as I say, for a change of pace, move into the area after we're finished with Hosea, which we'll probably take today, move into the area of of the pattern of eschatology and, and, and those issues that emerge in books like Daniel, Ezekiel, and so on, the passages will be uh, between you there. So that, that's what we hope now to be doing. But we uh, will now deal with Hosea. In fact, we had made a little start at, uh, at, at this book and the first three chapters and discuss in a broad way the, uh, the character of, of this strange uh, marriage uh, that uh, Hosea is commanded uh, to uh, uh, undertake and we uh, try to show once again the rootage of what the prophets were doing and their function and their message in, in Moses. And so we look back at Deuteronomy 31 and 32 and we found there the, the, the terminology uh, of uh, the Hosea 1 through 3, the whole business of the, the faithless uh, wife and uh, more especially, we saw that the situation in Deuteronomy 31 and 32 was uh, that, uh, that the Lord was himself entering into a, a, a covenantal engagement, into a marriage, if you will, uh, with his people Israel, full well knowing what soon enough would, would be the development there that having committed themselves, as Moses was calling on them to do, uh, to enter into covenant with the Lord, uh, that uh, soon enough, Moses himself shortly uh, dying, uh, being succeeded by Joshua, they, they would be departing from their commitment and uh, being unfaithful to the Lord, which would then bring on all manner of calamities and their ultimate fall in terms of the Mosaic uh, covenant of, of works, but uh, also we saw as, as part of the threats uh, that were extended to them uh, as their future faithfulness was contemplated, uh, that there was the thought of the jealousy of God, which would be uh, 
so stirred up uh, by their leaving him and committing themselves to, to that which would be called a, 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 a no God at all. And, uh, and so God's uh, own jealousy and would be provoked uh, by this. And in terms of the Lex Talionis um, uh, principle, he in turn would provoke his people to jealousy as he punished them by using as his instrument a not no people. So they would incite his jealousy with no gods and, uh, and uh, he would incite the, uh, their jealousy with uh, a, a, a no people, with a non-covenantal people, referring of course to the, the future exile they experience. So all, all of that provides a very much of a, a background then for what we encounter in Hosea 1 through 3 in terms of situation and, and, and terminology and ultimate prospect of, 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 of things. So in terms of the the imagery, it's of course that of the, the faithless wife that we encounter again in, in, in Hosea. And in, as he moves, as he does in each of the three cycles in the first three chapters, as he moves through the old covenant development with its indictment and its judgment into the new covenant stage, uh, he employs that language of Moses and Deuteronomy where he, he speaks of the uh, that which had become no people at all, lo ami, will once again become ami, uh, my people. So he reflects on, uh, uh, on, on that happy prospect using, uh, again, Moses who heralded the new covenant. And so Hosea also heralds the new covenant as well as prosecuting the lawsuit. The, those, those two things we keep talking about and necessarily so because that's what we keep meeting with in all the prophets. So what we're gonna see very much here in Hosea one through three following after Moses is the, the, the conducting of the lawsuit leading up to the fall of Israel and, and yet and, 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 and quite abruptly in, in each of the cycles uh, the, the thought of beyond that uh, there will be uh, that new covenant the fulfillment of the never annulled Abrahamic covenant which was uh, still in force through all of this and that prospect of the new covenant was there and so uh, Hosea heralds uh, that, that as well, using again that, that language of, of Moses and uh, the, this language of the no people becoming God's people again so on um, uh, is quoted in both the language of, of Hosea 2 and the language of Deuteronomy uh, the 31 and 32 are, are quoted in the New Testament and, and uh, in Romans in chapter 9, chapter 10 and also in, in uh, first uh, Peter uh, and uh, so we have the kind of hermeneutical direction once again here that, that uh, we relish, you know, that, that uh, we have the assurance as, as we did when we were dealing, dealing with Deuteronomy 30 and we could turn to Romans 10 and see uh, the, the Pauline interpretation of it. And so that puts us right on target. And then once again here in dealing with um, the, 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 this material in Hosea, uh, we, we have again Pauline and Petrine uh, hermeneutical direction telling us <coughs> that indeed we should be uh, finding in, in these prophecies messianic uh, material and as a matter of fact that the last two words that we will be, be dealing with in chapter 3 are ba'aharith <coughs> ha'yamim that, that, that's got logical formula that we have uh, seen previously and, and talked a little bit about and mentioned uh, Lavos's treatment of it in the uh, first chapter of his Pauline eschatology. And uh, so, Baharit Hayamim, that's, that's the closing word uh, in Hosea 1 through 3 that identifies what has gone before as uh, appertaining, at least in its uh, uh, forward uh, uh, reach, to the age of the New Covenant. So uh, th that's the, the, the general picture of wh where we are and, and what we are doing. And, you know, I, I think here again that our structuring of the Mosaic Covenant in terms of the, uh, the, the two levels uh, will be vindicated and in fact uh, prove to be the key to the, to the main difficulties of interpretation that emerge in Hosea 1 through 3, uh, the, the two level things, so that uh, while indeed there, there is the, the typological national election works principle things going on that meanwhile the Abrahamic covenant is still in, intact and it will be 
the, the recognition of, of that latter fact that, that even when even when Israel is in exile that the, and uh, God is remembering not the Mosaic covenant but he's remembering the, the Abrahamic covenant in, in their behalf and that is still in place and uh, that will be explaining well it will be explaining verse 7 in chapter 1 which speaks about in Judah in contrast to, to Israel uh, but most especially it, it would be the, the recognition of these two levels of works at one level and grace at the, the, the other uh, that will provide the explanation for what is the most puzzling thing in this whole marriage business uh, namely the reunion that is described in, in, in chapter 3 and uh, in verses 2 and 3 and 4 especially the reunion uh, which one would think would be a part of the a description of, of the new covenant, but lo and behold, it's part of the description of the fall of Israel. So that's the real puzzler, isn't it, in terms of this symbolism. And we can understand that Jose is marrying a woman who proves to be unfaithful, uh, you know, that that, 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 that corresponds <coughs> indeed to the way in which Israel, married to the Lord, proves unfaithful and breaks the covenant. And, uh, and uh, so that Jose is that is separated from this woman, whether with a complete divorce or just some sort of separation we might uh, discuss. But in any case, the separation is, is mended, it is healed in terms of God's command to Hosea in chapter 3 to go and take her back. So there is a reunion of a marriage that has been disrupted. And one would think, as I say, that the reunion would be symbolizing the new covenant beyond the, the fall of Israel. But lo and behold, the reunion symbolizes the fall and the exile. But that, that's, that's the, the strange thing. How does that work? What, what is going on here? And as I say, I think uh, uh, apart from an awareness of the, the two-level structure of the Mosaic covenant, you really wouldn't have a satisfactory answer to these uh, particular puzzles. Well, now then... Structurally, as I said, the, this section, these three chapters, uh, divide into three cycles corresponding mostly but not entirely uh, with uh, the, uh, the extent of the chapters. Uh, and uh, so that the, the first cycle... Each, each cycle has uh, then two sections dealing with the, the, the Old Covenant and uh, one section dealing with the New Covenant. And uh, the A section uh, has to do with the, the, the indictment, hmm? the indictment of Israel, the breaking of the covenant symbolized by the, the faithlessness of the wife, et cetera, et cetera, by the, the names of, of uh, the children. And uh, so there is the, the indictment, there is the breaking of the covenant. And then the B section of uh, the opening two has to do with the judgment, the curses of the covenant, but that uh, this is upon them uh, for their unfaithfulness, for, for their uh, breaking of uh, the covenant. And then, as I say quite abruptly too, you come to the, the New Covenant, and it's a picture of the restoration of things, which is a total reversal <coughs> of uh, what has just been described as, as making up uh, the, the, the judgment of Israel in the place in the place of the fall. Now there is fullness. And uh, so the, the, this is the overall structure, and it's uh, easy to see the three sections here and in, in the, the second cycle. And, uh, but as I say, it's when you come to the third cycle that the, you hit the puzzler where the picture of the fall or, or exile, huh? uh, is symbolized in terms of a re re reunion. The opening verse uh, there would, uh, would uh, once again, describe uh, the, the wife in terms of our unfaithfulness, and so make the point of the indictment of the breaking of the covenant, and then the marriage reunion symbolizes the exile. And it's only in verse five. It's only in verse five that you come to the new covenant. And uh, by the way, wherever the new covenant is uh, 
being described. It is no longer the uh, marriage relationship that uh, that is uh, used to portray that new covenant. The marriage relationship uh, is used uh, to, to to set forth these two features. Uh, the names of the children are also used. Uh, the Jezreel, the low Rukama, the low I mean names of the children are also used uh, to set forth uh, the thought of the judgment. But the names of the children are also used to set forth the reversal, the redemptive reversal, as the name of Jezreel is looked at from a different perspective, and low Rukama becomes Rukama, and low Ami becomes Ami. And, and so it is in terms more of the reversal of the names of the children that there is a, a setting forth of, of the new covenant, whereas the marriage relationship itself is a, a setting forth of the, the sin and the, the fall of, of Israel alone, as particularly at this point in uh, verses then two through four, uh, that there is something more than just the fall of Israel in terms of the Mosaic Covenant uh, that, is, uh, that is in view in terms of the actual marriage relationship. Uh, so that, that's the, the ultimate crux of the thing that we will be aiming at. Now let's see then the first cycle would cover I guess there's a difference in the English numbering and chapter divisions here. But in, in the, the Hebrew, and let's get our Hebrew out, in Hosea, uh, the first cycle would run through chapter 2 in the Hebrew and verse 3, all right? So 1-1 one, one through 2-3 uh, would be the first cycle in uh, the Hebrew, and uh, then the rest of chapter 2, verses uh, 4 through uh, the, the end of that chapter, would be the second cycle. And the third cycle is much shorter, the, the chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. All right, so let's uh, then start with cycle 1 and section A, which will be now an account uh, uh, symbolic portrayal of uh, Israel's breaking of, of the covenant. I guess we did read a little bit of it, didn't we? Um, the, the opening verse, as we have seen, uh, dates this ministry of Hosea in terms of a succession of uh, kings in the, the north and uh, also in uh, the, the south. And then verse 2 tells us uh, the, the beginning of the Lord spake by uh, Hosea, we mentioned the uh, grammatical uh, unusualness of, of the uh, infinitive followed by the finite uh, verb, but the, it does happen. Uh, and so here's the beginning of uh, the Lord's revelation to Hosea. And uh, the Lord said unto Hosea, All right, go now and uh, take to yourself an Ashet Zinunim, uh, a, a wife of Hordoms, and uh, also <coughs> Yalde, children construct uh, plural, Yalde, children of Hordoms. And the reason, Hosea, that you are to enter into a, a marriage that is going to involve uh, a wife and children characterized by Hordoms uh, is uh, that your experience is to mirror and reflect uh, the Lord's experience with his people Israel, which uh, involve precisely. Uh, such uh, re results. And, and and once again reminding us uh, that uh, rooting this back in, in the experience of uh, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, we, we uh, uh, took the meaning of this uh, to be not that uh, the wife that he took, Gomer, was already uh, engaged in prostitution of, of of any particular kind, whether street prostitution or cultic prostitution, uh, when he married her, but rather that that's what she would turn out to be doing eventually, so that the propensity for for, for sin that, that were, the Lord saw in Israel and nevertheless took her into marriage, <coughs> that, 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 that's, I think, the way to view Hosea's marriage, that there was this propensity in Gomer 
uh, to end up in unfaithfulness and as a result of that to be bearing children who would not be uh, Hosea's uh, le legitimate children, but uh, children of whoredoms. Uh, th that's um, what was in, in, in view. Uh, but already she is then called an age that is in her name and God's command is, is obeyed. So being commanded uh, uh, to do this uh, and the reason being ki zano tizneha aretz meharayave because the, the land and that is one of those places where, where the, the land is obviously used for the, those who occupy the land for the population, the people of the land and uh, so the people of, of, of the, the, the covenant land is uh, no infinitive absolute underscoring the finite verb that follows to uh, Israel has an, uh, is indeed uh, prostituting herself, committing unfaithfulness from after Yahweh. She is departing from, maybe to, to do justice to the preposition min, from after. Uh, she is going astray, huh? Uh, Israel is going astray in her marriage from after uh, the, the, the Lord. That's the situation in Hosea. Your marriage is, is going to be symbolic of that. So go to and, and, uh, and marry her. And uh, that's the command. And uh, already then, not, not, that clearly would be part of section A, the indictment. Uh, uh, here is what is wrong with Israel. Described very plainly that she is breaking breaking the, the, the covenant, and that's being symbolized in, in the marriage. Verse 3, and uh, he, using the same verbs, to go and to take, and lakak being the common verb that is used to take, take in marriage, and so you don't have to add anything to it. So he went and he took, and the particular woman's name is Gomer, and uh, also known then as the daughter of Divlaim, and she conceived watahar, the verb hara, and uh, then vateled lo bain, and she bore to him a son. So here is the first of the three children that will be mentioned, and the names assigned by the Lord. And uh, in, in this case, uh, interestingly, we have the preposition lamed and the pronominal suffix o to him which would seem then to, to indicate that yes indeed, at least this first child was uh, uh, truly Hosea's own child. And uh, what makes us note that here is that the absence of, of this preposition and pronominal suffix, this low, in connection with the second and the third children, and that that's uh, maybe a first thing that, that alerts us uh, to the, the fact that the second and the third one apparently were uh, not uh, Hosea's own. And, and this impression, I think, will be supported when we uh, move on into the second cycle. Uh, and uh, there is a uh, denouncing of, of the sins of, of uh, the mother uh, as one who has acted shamefully and so on. And, and that notation of her shameful action is associated immediately with the names of the, the second uh, and, and the third children. It's over against the first. So there, there are, are, are several indications uh, then. Uh, that, uh, that that rather clearly the second and the third, if, if not then the first one, also were Yalde Zinunim, indeed, the children of, of uh, Hordoms. But uh, this first one could well be Hosea's own, because as I say here, it says that she bore to him uh, a, a son. Now then, um, we have that, that, that second layer of symbolism, I say, along with the, the marriage uh, relationship it itself, the names of the children uh, are put to use uh, to depict both uh, the, the judgment of the fall and then afterwards uh, the uh, re renewal of the, of, of the covenant. Now then, this first one, according to the Lord's uh, direction, is uh, named Jezreel. And uh, the Lord uh, then, then said uh, unto him, Kira Shemo Yisrael. And so name this one Jezreel. And the explanation given uh, is one then that shows that this name is being thought of in terms of uh, particularly, not of its etymology, in, in, uh, when the name Jezreel is used to describe the blessings of the new covenant. 
the etymology of the thing is seized upon God sows, huh? Uh, and, and, and that's indicative of a positive blessing. God broadcasts the, the seed so that there's a great harvest un, under the new covenant. And, the, and the universally, the Gentiles come in and, and so on is the thought there. So that plays with, with the etymological meaning of, of Jezreel. But now here in the first instance, uh, the name Jezreel is, is not being etymologized in that way, but it's being used to recall a, a particular location and the historical events associated with it that involved the northern kingdom in sin that brought down the denunciation of the Lord. What had happened there, well, we're talking about Jezreel uh, in the Greek form, Esdralon, the, the, the valley, the plain of, 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 of Esdralon, Je Jezreel, the, the valley, the plain, and also the city that uh, was, was located uh, there. Well, what had happened there? Uh, Ahab, huh? Vineyard. Yeah, exactly. So this, this is the episode of uh, of uh, Ahab. It filled up uh, the uh, measure of uh, his sins uh, there at David's uh, vineyard, uh, and uh, with uh, the, the the murder of uh, Naboth, and and for this uh, dastardly deed there that took place at uh, Jezreel, uh, the uh, uh, the extermination of, of Ahab's uh, house uh, was threatened, 1 Kings uh, 21, 19 and following. And uh, th this then came to pass uh, when uh, God, through Elisha, uh, uh, commissioned Jehu later on uh, to destroy the, the whole house of uh, Ahab and its idolatry, 2 uh, Kings uh, 9 and following. And uh, this took place in Jezreel. So the, the, the final sin of Ahab took place there. The uh, extermination of, uh, of his house by Jehu uh, took place uh, there. And uh, now then, uh, the next development, however, is that although it was at God's command that, that Jehu carried out this execution, uh, that uh, nevertheless, uh, he too, is uh, frowned upon, and, and Jehu's uh, dynasty is, is uh, also threatened with, uh, with the judgment because of the blood of Jezreel that he has, has uh, shed, and, and, and why so? I mean, he was commissioned by the prophet to do it. Why, why should he, his dynasty now also be threatened with destruction? And the, the, the answer seems to, well, it, it's similar, is it not, then, to the way in which uh, God used the Assyrians and the Babylonians uh, uh, to uh, bring judgment uh, uh, on his people Israel. And uh, yet, as for example, it is put in one place in the book of Zechariah, the, these, these nations uh, who, who carried out God's plan did it, uh, you know, not out of uh, uh, motivation that uh, was one of uh, obeying the Lord and, and something, but they did it for evil. Huh? Uh, they had e evil motivations. Their, their own uh, selfish interests were, were being uh, fed and satisfied by uh, carrying out uh, this particular thing. And therefore, <coughs> God threatens the, these uh, nations uh, who had carried out his will. He threatens them, too, with the destruction. Well, in the same way, I think, with Jehu. Jehu uh, himself, then, uh, continued in the ways of Jeroboam the first and, and the sins of of Jeroboam, and then they therefore showed that uh, although he formally executed the God's judgment on, on uh, the house of Ahab, that nevertheless he in his heart wasn't with it, and uh, uh, he was committing the, essentially the, the same kind of, of unfaithfulness uh, to the Lord, and uh, so his the blood he shed was a way uh, was blood guiltiness for uh, for himself, and uh, so th these are the associations uh, then uh, of. Um, the, the, the Ezra, it, it's the, the sin of Israel that had been denounced and uh, that threatened uh, with a, a judgment. And na name this boy, name this the first uh, the child, therefore, uh, Jezreel, uh, because uh, God's remembering uh, this sin. So the Lord said unto him, Name him Jezreel, for in yet a little while the threatened punishment. It's going to be carried out. And in yet a little while, upakadti, we come upon, I think, or if we haven't, we will be coming upon quite frequently, this verb pakad, and we want to get accustomed to a variety of meanings uh, that it has uh, 
it can have both uh, positive and negative overtones. It's it's a it's an act of visiting or uh, God's taking account of intervening, uh, whether for, for, with with punishment or or with a reward. As I say, it can go uh, either way. It can have the thought of God's appointing someone. Uh, here, the, the, the negative idea of, of God's taking punitive action is uh, what is in view. So yet a little while, God threatens, and, and I am going to visit the blood of Jezreel, the, the, the blood guiltiness of these historical events we've been referring to. Uh, I will visit, I will punish the blood of Jezreel upon uh, the house of Jehu. Hmm? So as we said, Jehu, in spite of the fact he carried out the God's command, is uh, now re regarded as essentially guilty of the same sort of uh, religious uh, sin. And uh, his house, uh, his dynasty, his dynasty is going to be terminated. And of course, the history shows how shortly enough uh, after uh, the, this reign of Jeroboam II, contemporary with Hosea, that, that, that things are going from, you know, quickly from bad to, to worse. And, and the dynasty of Jehu did become extinct, but it's not just that the dynasty would be lost and, and the kingdom would go on under some uh, other dynasty. Uh, the, the, the threat uh, is more than that. And so he says, Wahashbati Mamalakut Beit Yisrael, not just the, the house of Jehu, but the whole house of Israel, the whole northern kingdom uh, is threatened with uh, exile and, and uh, fall. And uh, to describe that collapse, uh, uh, the verb Shabbat is uh, used, and uh, so there is uh, this punning on the verb Shabbat, and so you think, of course, of Sabbath and, and all the wonderful positive things that, that the Sabbath would uh, connote in terms of, uh, of the eternal rest and, and the reward, and, uh, and yet the, you play on its meaning of, of to, to bring to an end, uh, in, in the sense of bringing it negatively to an end, to terminate, and so he puns here on the verb uh, Shabbat, and before we're, we're done with the first two cycles, we'll, we'll see that he, he, he puns on it again. And uh, in fact, the second time he puns on it, uh, he, the pun involves uh, that one of the things that will come to the, the, an end, one of the things that will be sabotaged in that sense, brought to an end, is the Sabbath itself. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> all of the good things in Israel's uh, life, their festivals and their Sabbath festival are going to uh, be terminated. Uh, this is all uh, part of the judgment. Clearly, now we are in, in section uh, uh, B of the first uh, cycle, the, uh, the, the, the depicting of the judgment of, of exile depicted in terms of the names of, of, uh, assigned to the children. Well, that was the first one. Uh, Jezreel spoke of coming judgment. And continuing the, uh, the thought of the judgment, verse 5, it shall be in that day, that day of divine visitation, now you have the verb shaver, to shatter, that I will shatter the keshet Yisrael, the bow of Israel, Baamek, Jezreel, in the valley of Jezreel. So here's the name again. And here's that name, Jezreel, uh, associated with the, the, the uh, royal pride and arrogance and, 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 and sin. And there seems to be the suggestion, too, then, that uh, uh, definitely that the kings of Israel were putting their confidence in their armies the contrast will shortly be drawn between Israel, the, the departing apostate community, and, and, and Judah, the community of, of the Davidic covenant, with uh, Judah being characterized by, <coughs> by trusting in, in the Lord rather than in armies and so on, and Israel uh, becoming like the nations. See, Israel is breaking down the middle wall of partition in a negative way. God has set up a middle wall of partition between Israel, his holy people, and the, the Gentiles out, out there who were not his people. And uh, now in, in a negative way, the Israelites are breaking down that wall of partition and they are melding, they are becoming one with the world, the, the, the world which looks to its own armaments and so on and doesn't trust in the name of the Lord. That's what Israel uh, has uh, become uh, along the way. And uh, so, of course, afterwards, Christ will come along and he will break down the middle wall of partition in a different way. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he will may, uh, break down the wall so that the, the Gentiles, who were no people, might come in and be melded with those who, who were the, the, the covenant people. Uh, but at this point, it's, it's uh, the Israelites who are trusting in their armaments. And, and maybe their, the Valley of Jezreel might have been thought of as a sort of a line of, of protection uh, from uh, the, the enemy, where there was an accumulation maybe of their military resources, a sort of... Uh, a Maginot line, if a few young people remember the, <laughs> that far back to, to the war where the French were putting their confidence in the Maginot line, which collapsed uh, very quickly under the Blitzkrieg. Well, the, the, the Valley of Ezralon maybe was uh, such a, uh, a hope for a Maginot line for the Israelites where, where their military forces were in place, but, but God's going to destroy that completely, this, this arm of flesh in, in which uh, they were putting uh, their their confidence. All right, that was Jezreel. Now we go on to the second child and the second name. And uh, so, so far, we, we know that God is threatening judgment uh, upon his people. The second name will, will intensify this and show that it, it's a situation where he's not going to show any mercy. Uh, we're, we're, we're beyond that. Uh, the, the lawsuit has been in, in process. And uh, we are beyond the, the stage then uh, where there, there uh, it can be mercy anymore. And then, of course, the name of the third child will go still father and uh, say that the punishment then will be one in which this unpitied people will even cease to be the covenant people whatsoever. So that the, the punishment which is in view, the fall, the exile, is actually the, the termination for 70 years. Uh, of, of the old covenant order, never to be renewed in terms of the Mosaic covenant, but yes, renewed in terms of the, the Abrahamic covenant, again, only for, for a, a season. But let's uh, look now at, the, at the, the second child. And uh, verse 6, Watahar, again from the verb hara, to conceive. And she conceived again. And once again, from the verb yalad, to bear a child. And, and she bore, this time, bat. I guess so. this probably rings some bells or something more ominous than bells in your mind if you... Wasn't this a verse in the test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Hebrew, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, I think bat turned into son in some of your translations. Uh, the, the, this one's the daughter, okay. And uh, so she... Uh, she conceived again, and, and she bore a daughter this time. And as I noted earlier, uh, the absence of the low. Huh? First child, son was born to him. That low is missing here, and then that makes you begin to, to be suspicious about whether it was a legitimate child or not. And uh, so she bore another one, Wyomer Lo. The subject of Wyomer is not indicated, but obviously is the Lord once again who dictates the names of the children. And uh, he, that is the Lord, said to him, uh, that is uh, uh, to Hosea, okay, now name this one uh, Ruchama. And if you uh, did uh, parse that uh, uh, form, it would be a Pu'al perfect uh, form. Not is she pitied or not? Will she be pitied? And uh, the, the explanation then, of course, is uh, that uh, this child shall be named not pity because this whole situation is reflective of God's relationship to Israel and God is not going to have pity any longer upon Israel. Ki lo osif, and uh, the, the, that was a, a, a form that uh, not a few of your papers had trouble parsing. Uh, it's from the verb yasaf with a yod. And uh, the, the aleph is the first person singular preformative of the imperfect. That counts for the aleph, so that we shouldn't be parsing it as from asaf, aleph, samak, pe, which is another verb altogether. So this is from yasaf, uh, which means to add uh, and can be used as an auxiliary verb to do something again. And it's hifiel imperfect for a singular. So God says, not will I any further, not will uh, literally I add that I should have pity, P-L imperfect from Racham, that I should have pity upon uh, the, the house of Israel. So the, the lawsuit process has reached a climax. 
uh, as it says in Second Chronicles 36, as we noted, the point came when it was beyond remedy, beyond remedy. I will not pity them uh, anymore. Uh, and then coordinate with that uh, are the words ki naso ese lahem, which can be uh, understood in a variety of ways. Uh, in uh, means to lift up, of course. And uh, it is, however, also used for the lifting up and thus the taking away of, of sins, and that's the force of it here. And uh, with the, the infinitive absolute, again, underscoring uh, the, the thought. Uh, so literally, that lifting up, I should lift to them. And so one way of, of understanding is, uh, this is that I, I will not have pity uh, upon the house of Israel um, you, you know, by way of forgiving at all their sins, uh, or you can uh, understand the the feature of ellipsis uh, and, and and double duty uh, elements in, in the, the parallelism here. And in this case, in particular, you could uh, assume an ellipsis of the negative low. So we we have had the negative. Not will I have pity. or not will I add to have pity, uh, you could uh, assume the ellipsis of, of that and then translate, not will I again have uh, pity upon the house of Israel, yes, not, reading the, 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 the low, not will I ever uh, at all forgive them, uh, then no mercy is going to be shown, in particular by way of forgiving their, their sins, judgment is definitely going to uh, come upon them. Now it's here in verse 7 that we get uh, uh, sort of a parenthetical thing about Judah, which uh, tells us that uh, along with the sin and the covenant breaking and the fall and, and the judgment that in terms of the old covenant, uh, that, that underneath uh, there, there's something else uh, there. Huh? The Abrahamic covenant is still there. It has come to development, especially in terms of the king promise and the Davidic covenant. And that Davidic dynasty is uh, down there in, in Judah. And uh, that development, which is a message of grace, is leading to the new covenant at, at last. And so the experience of Israel then is all in terms of that upper works arrangement thing. But meanwhile, God hasn't forgotten uh, this, this uh, other thing that, that undergirds it all, and which has come to expression, especially in Judah to the south. Now here we are in the 8th century BC. It's the, the, the end of the lawsuit uh, for the northern kingdom, but not yet uh, for the, the southern kingdom. And the thought seems to be that, that there is, the Judah is, uh, is the, the location where the, the, the messianic hope of the, the messianic uh, uh, king and formulated especially in the, the uh, Davidic covenant where all of that is intact. David's uh, successors are on uh, the throne uh, down in Judah. The, the, the theocratic principle is uh, still being maintained there, the recognition that then that the Lord is the God of the, this people, that one's confidence should be in the Lord not, and not in the arm of flesh and your, your, your armies in the valley of Jezreel or wherever to save you, but that the uh, the, the Lord is your confidence. He is the one who will send the, the greater David in, in, in due course uh, to, to be the, the, the Savior. And uh, so uh, what we will get on a fuller scale when we come to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the C section is anticipated here in, in verse 7. Other, otherwise, it would be a, the break would be quite abrupt uh, when, when you move from chapter 1 in the Hebrew text to chapter 2. This would be quite abrupt, but it's not as abrupt because uh, it might have been because here in verse 7 there is an anticipation of it which, which uh, makes us all aware of this two-level structure of things. Hmm? What a contrast between what's happening to the house of Israel and but something else altogether applies with the house of Judah. Now how, you know, how, how could this be if there's only one level that's operating uh, under the, the old covenant be one or, or the other, but what we see is that simultaneously two things are, uh, are, are going on here. So let's uh, read then verse uh, uh, 7. But, and, and you would, uh, I think, translate the vav adversative then, the contrast, to bring out the contrast. 
So I will not at all have mercy on, on Israel that I should in any way that I think of uh, forgiving them. But upon uh, the uh, house of Judah, now you get the opposite of, uh, of uh, already of uh, low Rukama. Uh, you, you get the, the, the positive thought, I will have pity uh, upon uh, the, the house of Judah. So that anticipates the reversal of names that will be developed more fully in, in descriptions of uh, the new covenant. But, but here, uh, that is already uh, in, in view. So as, as for Judah, I will have pity upon uh, her. And I will save them. So, of course, the root Yasha, from which Joshua, Jesus, he feel uh, in perfect form, Bob, consecutive, phenomenal suffix. I, I will save them. How will I save them? Well, I will save them by the, the one in whom they have put their trust. They have put their trust in Yahweh Elohim, and that's the, how I will save them. I will save them. I will save them by Yahweh, their God. Not as uh, the northern kingdom uh, would suggest by armies and so on. Not will I save them by the bow and by the sword and, and, and by warfare and by susim and parashim, by horses and a horseman. Uh, and, uh, no, the, the, uh, this is not like the kingdoms of the world. This is my kingdom and, and I am the Lord and the savior of uh, my, my people. Well then, after this parenthesis, uh, we, the, we move on to the, the third child. And uh, verse 8 has a, a touch. And, and after she had weaned lo uh, the kind of natural touch that uh, would reveal that this was a, a real historical situation. This was not just some vision or allegory. So after she had weaned lo Rukama, then she conceived and she bore, and this time a son. And once again, the the missing ne negative, huh? uh, the, the mis missing to him. Um, she bore a, a son, and uh, I, uh, and he said, again, the Lord is the subject, and he said, uh, name this one Loami. So here we have the climax from Jezreel, the occasion of, of sin and threat of judgment to Lo Ruchama, beyond pity. And uh, here to Loami, the termination, the rupture of, of the covenant relationship. So name this one, not my people, uh, for you, in fact, are not my people anymore. Uh, the, 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 that's it. The, the Mosaic covenant came to an end at, at that point. However, it was resumed again. It did come to an end, which could not possibly uh, be, have been the case if it had not been a, a, a works arrangement. If it had been a grace arrangement, it could not have been the case that the whole people became uh, the low ami, and as we pointed out more on one occasion, uh, the whole people, corporately, including even the elect, huh, uh, wouldn't make any sense in terms of a, of a covenant of grace uh, to say that the, the punishment uh, came, and when it came, it didn't take any account of the difference between elect and non-elect, but, but, but this one did. Uh, uh, did, did ignore the, that the distinction, and, and Daniel and the remnant uh, suffered this. They became lo ami, uh, and how could that uh, uh, be? That can only be if they become lo ami uh, in a typological uh, uh, sense, because certainly they were not lo ami in terms of their ultimate spiritual identification as those who, before the foundations of the world, were electing Jesus Christ, that Daniel and the remnant were. But simultaneous, simultaneously, they are part of the Loami, and simultaneously, they lose their place in, in Canaan and uh, find themselves there in the midst of the uh, world power. So you know, I keep submitting that, that you can't understand the Old Testament. You, you can't make sense of, of, of these strange uh, uh, contrast uh, uh, if you're not aware of it and, and dealing seriously uh, with these two different worlds uh, two different uh, uh, levels so call them lo ami because you are not my people anymore well anarchy and as for me so it was atem as for you lo ami as for me lo uh, yeah. uh, uh there are several ways to take this lo uh, yeah. Uh, and the one I was just suggesting would be that uh, as for you, 
you are going to be low on me from now on. And as for me, I, in relationship to you, am going to be low eh yeah. Now, in other words, eh yeah would be used as uh, the divine name, hmm? as an explanation of the tetragrammaton, the, the Yahweh. Uh, it would be uh, uh, God as, as the eh yeah. I am, and, um, and I favor the understanding of, uh, of uh, that name of God as uh, bringing out the, the availability, the, the, the presence of, of God as the, the one who has made covenant and, and who is present in, in power and faithfulness to fulfill the, the terms of the covenant. That, that's what Ahia brings out, that I am your God. And I remember my covenant promises, and I am present with you and mighty to save you. But now God is saying, uh, you're going to be low uh, me, to me, and, and I, in relationship to you, will no longer be eh, yeah, the one who is present and, and helping you. So that, that's, that would be one way to take it. Other ways, of, and they, we all uh, know what the thing means. It's, it's the termination of the God-people relationship. But gr grammatically, then, uh, other ways of of taking this, uh, some suggest uh, that we should add the word Elohim. Hmm? So you will not be to me uh, uh, people, uh, me, and I will not be to you Elohim, a, 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 a God. So you'd have to add that. Others suggest that we should just recombine. If you look at the uh, the consonants that you're dealing with in, in Ehye and Lachem, with a, a little bit of manipulation, you, you might get out of it Elohechem. Hmm? And, and some suggest that that's what you do, and so it would be, and, and I will not be your God uh, anymore. Or uh, the verb eh yeah, could simply, in, instead of being sort of a predicate noun, the name eh yeah, it, it could have the verbal force, and so the translation uh, might simply be, and as for me, not will I be to you. Hmm? Just taking a, a straight value as, as a verb, I will not be, and then the, the date of advantage, perhaps with the law, I will not be to you, and supplying the thought of the, your help or your God, and, and so on. So there's a variety of, of ways in which you can finesse the, the grammar of this thing, uh, all of them making the simple point that the, the covenant relationship, the God-people relationship, uh, is threatened to, to be, to be uh, terminated. Well, that brings us then to the end of the, the treatment of of the old covenant in terms of the breaking of the covenant and, and uh, the judgment curses of the covenant. And other than for that seventh verse, uh, that parenthetical anticipation, what an abrupt shift now when we, we move our eyes to the next verse, uh, chapter 2, when all of a sudden it's, the, the Israel is blossoming out all, all over the place, as in uh, we, we, we looked at the, uh, the treatment of the incoming of the Jacobites and the embarking of the tent and as it's treated in Isaiah in the amazement of Mother Israel, where all of these uh, children uh, came from overnight, the nation is born. It's, it's that kind of thought uh, here that strikes us all of a sudden. Uh, the number of the B'nai Israel uh, is going to be the whole Hayam, like the sand of the sea, Asher lo yamad, so from the ayin ayin verb madad, uh, you got a nifal form here, nifal imperfect, it, it cannot be measured, and uh, then in parallelism uh, for the verb uh, here, safer, it cannot be counted, and, and so they were, the Israelites, instead of being uh, men of number, uh, of, of fewness, uh, diminished by the exile, uh, more will be the children of the desolate woman, you remember Isaiah. More will be the children of the desolate woman, the covenant community in its post-exile stage, uh, leading into the new covenant, uh, than the, the children of the married woman uh, back in the glory days even of David and, and uh, Solomon. Uh, that, that's the picture here. And of course, you, you recognize the language of the Abrahamic covenant, the specific terminology. God's promise to Abraham of his descendants being like the stars of heaven and the sand by the, the sea and so on, uh, beyond numbering. And so now we are be beginning to uh, get this reversing of the children's names. And, and this first one, the, the multiplying of Israel beyond counting, will, of course, be the, the result of, of 
now etymologizing that name Jezreel, no longer thinking of it in terms of that which recalls their, their, their sin that brought judgment on them, but now in terms of what it actually means. And so from Zara to so and Ael, Jezreel, you, you get God sows. He broadcasts the, the, the seed of his kingdom and produces the, the, this numberless harvest. It shall be then, it goes on, that in the place where Yehameh, another Nifal and perfect, he was said to them, Lo Ami, and of course now we have a, a, the third of the names is going to be reversed, where the, 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 in their exile situation where they, they cease to be the covenant people, uh, where it was said to them, you are not my people, they're precisely uh, there as, as Christ, as we said, breaks down the middle wall of partition and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Gentiles and, and the Israelites become Gentiles, huh? uh, uh, will be uh, brought in, in great numbers back into the kingdom. And so where it had been said to them, uh, you are not my people, it will be said to them, uh, B'nai El Chai, you are the children of the living God. Covenant renewed, enmity between the woman now and Satan, God reverses uh, things. One of the things we're interested in doing here as we look at each of these C sections of the three cycles is to, to uh, observe the use of prophetic idiom, the new covenant, the church realities are being described, but they're being described uh, in, in terms of the, the Old Testament situation of the tribes and their exodus from Egypt and they're moving through the land and they're settling in the land and and the, the, the presence of the king in the midst of them, and then later on, having been exiled from the land, they're bringing back to the land. In other words, what we're going to be noticing is that the whole gamut of, of Old Testament history uh, is, uh, is surveyed and exploited in order to portray the realities of the new covenant so that the net result is going to be that if you wanted to be a literalist about this, you can't just stop with the imagery that uh, God... Uh, is bringing back the 12 tribes uh, from among uh, the nations, uh, you're, you're going to have to literalize the whole thing so that you would have to be suggesting that one is to anticipate under the new covenant uh, another exodus from Egypt and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a repetition of, of virtually the, the, the whole history of Israel uh, from Moses uh, up to the uh, restoration from exile. And I don't think anyone really we will want to do that, and they'll recognize that, that the, the, the typological principle enters in somewhere here. But if somewhere, then of course no reason why you should insist on the literalness of the, of the imagery of the returning of, of tribes from the nations uh, back to the land of promise. That's just one uh, uh, part of a, a total pattern that you're going to have to take consistently, and in the right way, obviously, to do it in the light of the New Testament is to recognize that we are dealing here with prophetic idiom. And uh, so as we look at verse uh, 2, it will say, it will now point to that stage in, in Old Testament affairs uh, of the United Kingdom. That's the ideal, of course, before the, before the schism, before the departure of the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom, when they were all together. That was the ideal stage. And, and of course, it is the, the ideal e events of the Old Testament that are seized upon to portray the nature of the New Covenant. The New Covenant is going to be one of great union hmm? uh, uh, of God's people, not just of uh, Judah and Israel, uh, but uh, of, of Jews and Gentiles as well. And uh, so they will be gathered together, Nifal form from Kavats, the Bnei Yehuda, and also the Bnei Yisrael, they will be gathered together. And, and here then we have the two groups in terms of the contrast that had been set up between them. There's Israel, who goes into exile and becomes virtually like the Gentiles. But then there's also so Judah. Uh, there's the, the, the remnant who will constitute the core of, of, of the new covenant. And, uh, but the middle wall of partition will be broken down. They will be brought together, these two, two, two groups. Uh, the Gentiles incorporated along with the believing Jews in this new reality of the body of Christ. So the, the children of Judah will be gathered together and the children of Israel together, all kinds of grammatical forms, nifal and adverbial words, uh, uh, yakdav, to, to emphasize the cohesiveness, the, the, the union 
uh, the uh, t togetherness. And um, now verse uh, 3, get my dead screw. see manuscript out here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, verse, uh, three, and, and they will make for themselves uh, Rosh Echad, and they will go up from the land, for great is the day of Jezreel. And so you see uh, here now, it, it does specifically, uh, explicitly play with the word uh, Jezreel. And uh, verse uh, 3 picks up on the names uh, Lo Ami and Lo Rotama. And uh, I think we better uh, get our five minute break in here and then come back and finish off uh, that and then move on to the second cycle.